Good morning, everyone, and welcome. Oh, quite loud. Good morning, and welcome to church this Sunday. It's lovely to see you on. It's lovely to have everyone who's joining us remotely. Uh, shall we do our hello? I think we've got folks calling in from Dingwall, from East Lothian, from Barnet, uh, from Roslyn, from Windsor, from Greenwich, I think from Italy, I see there, uh, and from Edinburgh and the wider Edinburgh area. Uh, and from everyone in church, shall we give them all a great big wave? It's good to see you all. It's good to be able to connect with people uh, here and far, and it's lovely to be with you all. Uh, just a few announcements. Uh, as you'll remember if you were last week, we're still holding off on doing tea and coffee just uh, for um, uh, safety after the service. Um, though after the service, we are going to be having a meeting. Um, we're going to be doing one of our hymn choosing meetings. So the way we do it at Granton is we have uh, hymn choosing meetings after the service and they are open meetings. So if you've ever wanted to dabble in a little bit of hymn choosing, come and join us, see if you can squeeze your favourite hymn in. It'd be lovely to have you involved in that. This week, things are starting up again. So the, the Friday drop-in has already started back. Um, but the lunch club is going to be back on Wednesday uh, and the coffee morning is going to be back on Thursday. Now, I say that everything at the moment is provisional. So if, there, if you're ever unsure of anything, just check the website. That will always be the place that's most up to date. Or if that is at all an issue, just get in touch with Norman or I. Uh, lastly, just to let you know about um, coming up very soon. I've actually forgotten which one. Is it two Sundays away? I've put it on the slides though, so you'll be able to see it. Uh, can I see the next slide, Alan? Um, because coming up is our Thanksgiving and Memorial services on the 23rd of January. So this is an annual service we do uh, as a service of remembrance, of remembering people who have passed in the year gone by. And I feel especially this year, that'll be quite an important service. So um, if there's anyone you know who this might be relevant for, this might be a service to invite them along. And um, we'll be taking time in the service just to, um, to remember and to have a, a time to reflect. Um, but those are our announcements for today. Uh, I think that's everything. For, so for now, we're going to come to our time of worship together. And we're going to open by singing our first hymn, Seek Ye First. We will now have our first reading, which Max is going to bring us from Zoom. Good morning. This reading comes from the book of Psalms, starting at chapter one and verse one. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, 
nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, that bringeth forth his fruit in his season, and his leaf shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. Thank you very much. Um, I don't know about you, I'm still thinking a bit about Christmas, um, all of the Christmas traditions. There's one Christmas uh, tradition uh, or feature of Christmas that we haven't spoken about yet, and that is the traditional Christmas panic, which seems to at some point in the day happen. And at our Christmas day, we had had a very chilled Christmas day. We were down with Alice's family, it was very relaxed. Uh, but then my brother-in-law gets a phone call um, from his new mother-in-law and she calls up and says, hi, a uh, bit of a problemo. And um, the problemo was that uh, some of the cousins had tested positive for COVID. Now that wasn't the crisis. The crisis was that they were supposed to bring Christmas pudding. And now there was no more Christmas pudding at all. There was a flurry. We, we, we got into action. We were raiding the house. Eventually, the bro my brother-in-law was sent away with half a chocolate tort and some spare profiteroles. And he was, he was whisked down the road in order to save Christmas. But I, I feel like Christmas has always got one of those, hasn't it? The moment when you, when you realise that something isn't in the oven when it was supposed to be or, or something was wrapped and sent to the wrong person. Christmas is a time when we can often get a bit flustered, isn't it? Uh, but truthfully, it's not a seasonal thing. I think we can all admit that sometimes we can be a little bit blown about by life, that sometimes we can be a little bit quick to react. Now, this might be a bit tangential, but when it comes to being quick to change, uh, I, I can't think of this classic clip. So it's, a, it's a, a kind of old school Simpsons, but I think it makes the point very well. Shall we see the video now, Alan? We're just about to get our first pictures from inside the spacecraft with average, not Homer Simpson. And we'd like to... Ah! Ladies and gentlemen, uh, we've just lost the picture, but uh, what we've seen speaks for itself. The Corvair spacecraft has apparently been taken over, conquered, if you will, by a master race of giant space ants. It's difficult to tell from this vantage point whether they will consume the captive Earthman or merely enslave them. One thing is for certain, there is no stopping them. The ants will soon be here. And I, for one, welcome our new insect overlords. I'd like to remind them that as a trusted TV personality, uh, I can be helpful in rounding up others to toil in their underground sugar caves. Mm. Don't worry, kids. I'm sure your father's all right. What are you basing that on, Mom? Who wants ginger snaps? Well, this reporter was possibly a little hasty earlier. We'd like to reaffirm his allegiance to this country and its human president. May not be perfect, but it's still the best government we have. For now. Hmm? Oh, yes. Uh, by the way, the spacecraft's still in extreme danger. May not make it back attempting risky reentry. Blah, 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 blah. We'll see you after the movie. Thank you for indulging me with that. Uh, I, for one, welcome our new insect overlords. I think that is, that is a great quote, isn't it, for being a little bit too quick to change with the circumstances. Um, but I showed that and I'm talking about that because I think for all of us, it's really easy to get caught up in something, isn't it? You know, when everybody else is losing their heads or when we're, we ourselves are feeling a bit swept away by the feelings of it, it's so easy to get a bit carried away and to just react to everything that's going on. Well, I'm talking about this because today we're looking at one of the things that we do in church, and it's that we read stories from the Bible. We read every week stories that are over 2,000 years old. And that is a bit strange, isn't it? You know, that Simpsons clip, probably from the 90s, even that feels quite old these days. But we're reading, you know, that reading that Max read for us is a poem written millennia ago. But it's interesting that by reading these old stories, we can give ourselves some grounding. There's something about reading these 
ancient stories from the Bible that can help us to slow down and see the bigger picture. That psalm that was read today, Psalm 1, says that the person who meditates on God's law is like a tree rooted in place. That the, the scripture is like a source of water, and as a result, the tree bears fruit each year. You know, trees that have roots are fixed in place. They're very hard to move. In fact, when we had to have one of our trees taken down, we learned trees are very hard to move. Uh, they are designed almost to withstand even the wildest of storms. And the reason the Bible it talks about that is because when we read the Bible, it can give us an anchor. It can give us something to hold on to, even when everything else is uncertain. If the last two years have taught us anything, is that life can throw up a lot of surprises. But in the Bible, we can have a place that we can always come back to, a place with unchanging truths and familiar stories that we can always return to. And so when things come up in life, when big things change, we don't need to run around like headless chickens. We can turn back to those timeless stories that we find in scripture, and they can give us a chance to breathe, to focus on what's important, and then go back into the world with a new perspective. So we are going to pray. Now we're going to have some time to reflect on that, and then we'll say the words, one of the prayers that we find in the Bible, the Lord's Prayer, together. So let us pray. Loving God, thank you for the gift that is your word. Thank you that you have given us the scriptures as a place that we can turn to, a source of wisdom, of encouragement, of challenge, of hope. We thank you that every week we have the opportunity to look at them, to learn from them, and to connect with people of faith who lived thousands of years ago, but who also struggle with many of the same things that we do and want the same thing, to, to follow you and to have a relationship with you. Guide us and help us as we open your word to help us to understand what it means and use it to speak into our lives so that we have the opportunity to learn and be guided by you. And we pray together that as a community, as a group of people, that we can learn together, encourage one another and build up each other in faith and in hope in you. And so we pray using the words that Jesus taught us to pray all those years ago, saying, Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I'd like to invite Sandra up, who's going to lead us in our second reading. The second reading this morning is taken from the Gospel according to Matthew. Matthew chapter 13, starting at the beginning. The parable of the sower. That same day, Jesus left the house and went to the lakeside, where he sat down to teach. The crowd that had gathered round him was so large that he got into a boat and sat in it while the crowd stood on the shore. He used parables to tell them many things. Once there was a man who went out to sow corn. As he scattered the seed in the field, some of it fell along the path and birds came and ate it up. Some of it fell on rocky ground where there was little soil. The seed soon sprouted because the soil wasn't deep. But when the sun came up, it burnt the young plants. And because the roots had not grown deep enough, the plants soon dried up. Some of the seed fell among the thorn bushes, which grew up and choked the plants. But some seeds fell in good soil and the plants produced corn some producing a hundred grains, others 60 and others 30. And Jesus concluded, listen then if you have ears. Then the disciples came to Jesus and asked him, why do you use parables when you talk to the people? Jesus answered, the knowledge about the secrets of the kingdom of heaven have been given to you, but not to them. For the person who has something will be given more so that he will have even more than enough. But the person who has nothing 
will have taken away from him even the little he has. The reason I use parables in talking to them is they look, but they do not see, and they listen, but they do not hear or understand. Amen. Thanks be to God for the reading of his word. Thank you. Um, so through January, we are looking at ways to find God. Last week we looked at finding God in nature, and today we're looking at finding God in the Bible. Now, we read the Bible every week. Uh, on Sunday, we need to have two readings, so we get uh, quite a lot of Bible reading in our lives. Uh, but we don't always take a step back to look at what it actually is, this book that is so foundational to our faith. So what is the Bible? Um, just to kind of lay the groundwork before we kind of talk about it. Well, the word Bible is a Greek word, and it just means books. And that's what the Bible is. It's a collection of books. There's 66 in our Bible. It will depend on which church you're in. Some have more. Um, but we have 66 books, and they were written over the course of a thousand years. And as a result, they are incredibly diverse. There is a huge range of things in the Bible. But it's not a random collection. You know, these books were selected over centuries by people of faith because of the way that they talk about who God is and the story of God's people. And it is a big collection. You know, you have the, the longest book in the Bible, Psalms, 150 ancient songs of praise. Uh, then you have the letters of Paul, which were real letters sent to communities of, of flourishing Christians around the Roman world. There's books like Song of Songs and Ode to Romantic Love and Esther, a historical epic of with, you know, intrigue and court drama. And interestingly, those last two are the two Bible books where God is never explicitly mentioned. You get wisdom literature, you famously get Proverbs, uh, which tells you how to live a good and upright life. And then right after it is Ecclesiastes, which reminds you that everything you do is going to fade away and you're going to die eventually. You know, a, real, a real double act there. Uh, you get all sorts of things from the creation poetry of Genesis to the apocalyptic visions of Revelation. There is a real astonishing range of texts in the Bible. They're all different. They all have different things to say and they need to be read in different ways, but all of them help us to understand who God is. And the Bible is a really special book uh, to us. I'm always teased for having too many Bibles, so I thought I'd bring you a selection of mine. Uh, this was my university Bible. It has a, a, an incredible property, and that is, it fits in a back pocket. So this was this is the Bible, you know, when I was young and zealous, I could go around with a Bible in my back pocket. I was that kind of student. Uh, but it has a message in it from my grandmother, and this was uh, uh, on the day of my baptism, the 24th of April, 2013. Uh, I also have, this is my New Century Version Bible, Holy Bible, and it's got an inscription on it as well. Uh, presented to David Moody, June 2004, on promotion to lasers at Belhaven Church. Our church groups were going through a space, well, they did a space topic once, and then they kept the names, so for no good reason, it was Launchpad and Lasers. Um, but this was the Bible I was given when I was promoted to the older group. And this one is a really special one. Uh, this one uh, was given to me on my baptism day, but the inscription it says, presented to William Crawford Macmillan, my grandfather, on the occasion of his baptism on December the 10th, 1950, from mum and dad. And it has a verse written on it, to obey is better than sacrifice, 1 Samuel 15, 22. So this is the Bible my grandfather was given on his baptism that then was entrusted to me, because I am the keeper of all the family Bibles, apparently. Um, but Bibles can be special to us, and the verses can be special to us too. You know, that, that inscription probably meant a lot to my granddad. Um, and there are verses that can mean a lot to us. I was wondering out of curiosity, for people who got married and got married in a church, do people remember what the Bible reading was at their wedding? Some people do. What can, does it, can we shout them out? What were some of them? Corinthians 13 classic. What was your Jillian? Same, yeah, oh, it's a classic. We went, we went for Song of Songs, we went for the, um, the, the controversial option. Um, but all of us, so a lot of us will have verses that mean something to us or a story that sticks with us or a Bible character we really relate to and they can go through us through our lives. And the Bible is a place that we can encounter God and not just learn facts about God, but meet the living God, a God who is present in our lives. So today we're going to look at 
how we do that? How do we find God in the Bible? Well, if we're going to find God in the Bible, the first thing we have to do is read it. And this is where we need to acknowledge that is not necessarily the easiest thing to do. The Bible is a challenging book to read. Um, so, I mean, first, where do you begin? You'll need to find a translation. Um, I don't think anyone here is fluent in ancient Greek and Hebrew. If you are, you can just tune out for this bit. For the rest of us, most of us can't. Most of us need to have a translation. Um, and you, there are lots of different translations of the Bible into English. In fact, those three Bibles, NIV, New Century Version, and the King James, all different translations. And how these translations work is that they have to make choices. I think there's a diagram here of the, there's a spectrum of different ones. Some go for more word for word translations, others go for more paraphrases. Um, now, there isn't necessarily a better or a worse in this spectrum. They do different things and they make different choices. And people can have preferences. Now, I quite like the NRSV. Um, some people really love the freshness of reading the message, which are really kind of the most paraphrase of the paraphrases. Uh, other people like the tradition of reading the King James and the kind of the, the very familiar language of it. And there's nothing wrong, of course, with the good news that we use every Sunday. In fact, nowadays, if you go, like, if you look at verses online on, on a website or in the Bible app, you can often choose your version and look through them, um, different ones. And sometimes, actually, you can compare different translations, which can be helpful to understand things when sometimes it doesn't make sense. Uh, for example, Philippians 1 verse 8, if you read it in the King James, it would read, uh, for God is my record. And I think I've got that one up on the screen. Yeah, for God is my record, how greatly I long after you all in the bowels of Jesus Christ. On first read, that might be a bit strange, but if you read it in the NIV, it reads, God can testify how long, how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus, which is maybe a little easier to understand. And then after you've got your translation, there is a question of where to begin. You know, as we were saying, the Bible is a very diverse book, and honestly, some parts are easier to read than others. If you were to open your Bible to the book of First Chronicles, uh, chapter 1, verse 1, it starts, Adam, Seth, Enosh, Kenan, Mahale, Jareth, Enoch, Methuselah, Lamech, Noah. The sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, the same sons of Japheth nine chapters of names it has it's just a huge long list of genealogies now that is important it does play a role in bible history but for your average reader it is not a fun ride and you can be forgiven for that not wanting to be the place where you start so where do we start well as christians the obvious place is the gospels matthew mark luke and john they tell us the story of jesus in fact, if you read them, you'll probably find yourself recognizing most of the stories because, you know, the parables of Jesus are famous. But actually, you'll find things you didn't notice. When we did our thought for the day, we went through the whole of the Gospel of Matthew. And I find it really interesting how many parts of Matthew, despite having read that book my whole life, there were stuff that I'd never noticed before that I'd missed. Alternatively, though, I think the Psalms are a really good place to start. They're usually quite short, 119 is the exception. Psalm 119 has 176 verses. It's the longest in the Bible. So maybe not start with that one, but you know, lots of them are short and they're, they're easy to understand and they often don't require a lot of context, which is a real big help with the Bible sometimes. And they speak to so many aspects of life, joy, disappointment, justice, peace. One of my favorite is Psalm 139. And one part of it that I really like you search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, O Lord, you know it completely. You hem me in behind and before you lay your hand upon me. That's a really nice image. And the Psalms are full of those kinds of images. And then after that, it's just about looking for books that seem interesting. You know, Old Testament books like Ruth or Esther or Jonah, they read like short stories. Or, you know, Paul's letters like Galatians or Ephesians, they're full of really fascinating ideas. And alternatively, what you can do is look up stories that you want to read. Um, so, you know, if you wanted to read the story of David and Goliath, I'm not sure many of us would know that off the top of our head that it's tucked away in 1 Samuel 13. 
or that the story of Joseph and his and his coat uh, is covered between Genesis 37 and 50. It's a really long story, that one, actually. And also, often, I find this doing, when we did David and Goliath with the children, I read the original, and often you'll find when you read the originals of those familiar stories, you'll notice quite a lot of details that you didn't realize were there in the first place. Now, even with, you know, these, you know, you're getting the right good translation, a good starting point. You know, reading the Bible won't always be easy. That is, fit. we need to admit that. that. Of course, it's not always an easy read. But sometimes, I think that's the point. You know, our story was about the famous parable of the sower. And Jesus finishes his parable with the words, whoever has ears, let them hear. And then Sandra read, the disciples came up to Jesus afterwards and said, well, why do you teach in parables? And Jesus' answer is actually quite shocking. He says, not everyone is supposed to understand me. You know, you get me, but they don't. Now, that seems like quite a strange thing to say. Surely you would want to speak clearly so that everyone can understand what you're saying. But that depends on what you're trying to do. You know, if you're trying to gain as many followers as quickly as possible, then yeah, what you probably do is make your message simple, easy, you, you, you just do whatever you needed to do to get people to switch to your side. Have you ever been asked on the street to sign a petition? Now, do you think the person wanting you to sign that petition really cared that much that you knew the ins and outs of the, of the detail, the argument, that you were signing it in good conscience, or did they want your name on a piece of paper? If you're trying to sign up signatures petition, you just get the name. But that wasn't what Jesus wanted to do. He wanted people to be transformed. He wanted people to think about these ideas, to actually grapple with them and allow that to change their lives. I think what makes me think of is, if you can remember back to school, if it's not too traumatic, and think back what happened. Imagine you're in maths and you've, you've written down the answer. It's the right answer, but you've only written down the answer. What would the teacher say to you? That's good, but you've got to show you're working out. They, they want to know that not just that you can finish this one math problem, they want to make sure you understand it so that you can do it again. And that's, I think, similar to why Jesus taught in parables. Jesus didn't want to give people just a, a list of short rules and commandments they could just rattle off the top of their head. He wanted them to engage with his ideas and really think about them because it was in the process of engaging and grappling with his parables that they would be transformed. When we approach the Bible, we're not going to find a list of easy rules that we can go tick, tick, tick and be done with it. But that is a good thing. There's a reason why, you know, we, we have a sermon every single week. You'd have thought by now we'd know everything, you'd know everything about the Bible, and yet somehow there's more and more stuff to learn. But that's the point, because the Bible exists to stretch us, to challenge us, and to make us see in new ways. And so even when the Bible is challenging to read, sometimes that can actually be when it's at its most valuable, because that is helping us to grow and to stretch ourselves in ways that we didn't realize we could. So those are just a few things to think about. We're going to continue uh, to look at what we can learn about finding God in the Bible. But for now, we're going to sing our next hymn, Spirit of God and Seen as the Wind.
Oh dear, steamed up, I can't see you. Um, so uh, that's the little bit I'm going to need to wipe this off. Um, so that's some ways of kind of the, kind of the background. Um, and there are lots of different ways of reading the Bible. In fact, we have groups that meet at church that read the Bible together doing Bible study. And there's, you know, there's a whole range of people do it on their own with other people, all have different benefits. But there's one thing I wanted today to try and bring us something that we might not have heard of, but a different way of reading the Bible. Uh, and it comes back to a really interesting character, uh, a guy called St. Ignatius of Loyola. So last week, I've, I, apologies for all the saints you're getting at the moment, but last week I mentioned St. Francis and St. Columba, and they're exactly what you think of when you think of a saint otherworldly, spiritual, talking to birds, the whole picture. Ignatius was nothing like that. He was a very different sort of person. He was born in 15th century Spain, and when he was young, Ignatius wanted nothing more than to be a knight. He wanted the fame. He wanted the glory. He was in it for the adventure. Not exactly the ingredients you'd expect from a saint. When he was 17, he was taken on as a page and he began a career in the Spanish army. He was described as one historian as a fancy dresser, an expert dancer, a womanizer, sensitive to insult, and a roguish punkish swordsman who used his privileged status to escape prosecution for violent crimes committed with his priest brother at carnival time. <laughs> Ignatius, he was having a great time of it. He was loving life. But then when he was 30 years old, he, Ignatius fought in the Battle of Pamplona. A French cannonball ricocheted off a wall and it hit him in his leg. Uh, it shattered it into, and it, if that wasn't bad enough, it didn't heal properly, so it had to be rebroken, which, you know, in the Middle Ages, no anesthetic, that could not have been a fun experience. This was the end of his military career, uh, and he was sent for a long, slow convalescence in his family's castle. Now, the young knight was unsurprisingly bored out of his mind. And so no TV, no internet. What did he do? He asked for books to read. Now, he was really hoping he could get his hands on some of his favorites, you know, tales of chivalrous knights like El Cid and King Arthur. Instead, he found that in the castle, there were a grand total of two books and no Amazon to get any more. There was one book on the life of Christ and another book on the lives of the saints. And so with no other choice, Ignatius read them and he found himself captivated. He discovered that the, the lives of these saints that he was reading about were as, if not more, daring and exciting than any of the stories of knights in armor that he so loved. And they had that spirit of boldness and adventure that he had always yearned for. Now, lying in bed for all those months, Ignatius had a lot of time to daydream. And sometimes he would daydream like he used to do. He would dream of becoming a great knight, earning the respect of the king and, and marrying a beautiful woman. And it would be nice for a while. Uh, but then over time, the more he read, uh, he started to daydream more about living like the saints that he read about. And over time, he noticed how they made him feel. You know, after the night streams, he would wake up feeling unsatisfied, unfulfilled. But as he had more of those daydreaming about becoming a, like the saints that he read about, he started to experience this deep sense of peace and contentment. And so once he healed, he made a decision. He went to a monastery. He, he left at the altar his sword and his dagger, and he went off to live a life dedicated to God. Now, Ignatius would go on to lead a very busy and interesting life. He founded the Society of Jesus, the Jesuits. He, he wrote lots. He did a ton of things. But most interestingly, he wrote about his way of, of kind of living spiritually. And he developed or popularized a very distinct way of reading the Bible. Because during all those bedridden months, Ignatius had realized the power of his own imagination. And so he decided to use that in his Bible reading. In his spiritual exercises, he encouraged people to read the Gospels and actively imagine what it would be like to be there. Now, just to be clear, what he meant by this wasn't just to make stuff up. He wasn't encouraging people to just chuck the Bible out and just imagine whatever. But he, he wanted people to use their imaginations as a way to go deeper into the story and guided by the Holy Spirit, experience them in a more full way. 
And in particular, Ignatius wanted people to use their senses. You know, what would it be like to see a paralyzed man being lowered in from the ceiling above you? What did it smell like when Mary poured that perfume on Jesus's feet? When Jesus fed the 5,000, what did the bread and fish taste like? What did Jesus's voice sound like? And, and when the disciples touched Jesus's hands and felt the, the wounds, what did that feel like? Ignatius's way of the Bible is designed to help give us a fresh and imaginative insight on scripture. And it can help us to notice details that we might have missed and maybe take us in new and surprising directions. And it brings us into the story. Quite often when we study the Bible, we're trying to not think about ourselves. We're trying to put our, to think about how the story was originally meant. And that's an important way of Bible study. But in the Ignatian way, actually, we're encouraged to be a part of it and allow God to speak to us through it. So today, I wanted to finish by trying this out and rereading our scripture passage. But this time, I'd like you to try and read it using your imagination. So as we read the parable of the store, try to notice as, as we hear again, where is Jesus in the passage? How, what, where is he delivering it? And what would he have sounded like? And then as the story goes, try to imagine the story that maybe the sound the seeds make as they struck the path and the rocks or, or what the sore looked like. And just notice what happens. So uh, if you, well, we'll, we'll read together the story of the parable of the sower. That day, Jesus left the house and went to the lake side where he sat down to teach. The crowd that gathered around him was so large that he got into a boat and sat in it. While the crowd stood on the shore, he used parables to tell them many things. Once there was a man who went out to sow grain. As he scattered the seeds in the field, some of it fell along the path and birds came and ate it up. Some of it fell on rocky ground where there was a little soil. The seeds soon sprouted because the soil wasn't deep. But when the sun came up, it burned the young plants. Because the roots had not grown deep enough, the plants soon dried up. Some of the seeds fell among thorn bushes, which grew up and choked the other plants. But some seeds fell in good soil and the plants bore grain. Some had 100 grains, others 60 and others 30. And Jesus concluded, listen then if you have ears. I wondered if you noticed anything different in that reading, if there were any details that stood out from you. Is there anything maybe you missed the first time that we read it that you might have heard the second time? Reading in this way can be a really helpful way of noticing new details, but also bringing us into the story more fully. That was what it was intended to do. And Ignatius wrote a long list of spiritual exercises, much more complicated than I even understand, let alone could reliably convey to you now. But they are tools that can help us to find new ways to experience the Bible differently and encounter God differently. Uh, so I wondered if we could do one more reading. I'm going to do it to death, but one more reading. And I encourage you this time, maybe if you want to close your eyes and to do it more prayerfully. And this time I thought I'd return to um, a different passage and I'd like to use my grandfather's Bible. So we'll go from the King James translation, which will make it different again. Uh, but one last time, if you want to hear the parable of the sower, then we'll have a brief moment of silence afterwards. And then I'll finish with a prayer written by St. Ignatius that can help us to reflect. So we'll read one last time, the parable of the sower. The same day Jesus went out of the house and sat by the seaside, and great multitudes were gathered together unto him, so that he went into a ship and sat, and the whole multitude stood on the shore. 
And he spake many things unto them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went forth to sow. And when he sowed, some seeds fell by the wayside, and the fowls came and devoured them up. Some fell among stony places where they had not much earth, and forthwith they sprung up, because they had no deepness of earth. And when the sun was up, they were scorched, and because they had no roots, they withered away. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprung up and choked them. But others fell into good ground and brought forth fruits, some a hundredfold, some sixtyfold, some thirtyfold. Whoever has ears to hear, let him hear. prayer of Saint Ignatius. Take, Lord, and receive all my liberty, my memory, my understanding, and my entire will. All I have and call my own, you have given all to me. To you, Lord, I return it. Everything is yours. Do with it what you will. Give me only your love and your grace. That is enough for me. Amen. So I'd encourage you in the week to come, whatever way suits you, whether it's this more imaginative contemplation, Bible study, or whatever it is, to try opening the Bible. Maybe if you haven't done it for a while, to to give it a go and to just read maybe some of the stories of Jesus or some of the Psalms and see what you might be able to see of God in those stories. For now, we have a little bit of time for discussion after our service. And I wondered if we wanted to turn to the people next to us or to go into our breakout rooms on Zoom and to ask one another, um, is just maybe to share a part of the Bible that is important to us. So that could be a story that really resonates with you, a verse that you memorized maybe when you were young or uh, something that was included in a, on your wedding day or another special occasion. So if you want to turn to the people next to you, and we'll just have a couple of minutes to share about our own experiences with the Bible and things that stand out to us.
We are now going to come to our time for prayers for others. Sorry to cut conversation short. Uh, we're going to our, come to our time for prayers for others. So uh, if you'd like any names of people to be included in the prayers, if you're in the building, if you want to shout them out loud, if you're on Zoom, if you want to type them into the chat function and we'll get them all included. Priscilla and family. Helen, Evelyn, and George. Tom, was that? Brenda and family. Anne. Got Anne. What, Alison. Julian. Pat, Scarlett, Alan, Angus, Christina, and David. And David. Are there any others? Let us pray then. Loving God, we thank you for all the promises that are contained in your scripture. We thank you that you have promised to love us, to care for us. You have promised that the whole world is known by you and that you have a desire to see all things redeemed and restored. We thank you for those and we pray that we can place our hope in them, that even when things can seem really difficult around us, that we can put our trust in you and trust in your, your plan and your purpose. But we pray for a world that is deeply in need of help and support. We pray for the ongoing impacts of the pandemic. We pray for those in this country who have been affected, who are sick today, who are in isolation. And we pray especially for situations around the world that we know are worse than our own. We pray for countries that don't have the facilities we have and don't have access to the resources we have. For everyone who's living under the fear of uh, sickness and illness we pray that your comfort will be with them that you will be right beside them and they will experience your peace and your grace and we pray for a world that is in need of more peace and more grace we pray for situations of conflict and poverty situations where things seem to be getting worse we pray for your hand to be over all these countries places where there has been instability. We pray for, for peace, for your guidance and your wisdom to be with those that leaders would embrace one another and turn away from violence. And for our country, we pray that you guide our leaders, that you support those who work so hard for us each day. And for all those in our, in our communities, in our areas, we pray that you will be with them, alongside them, whatever they are going through. And we bring to you the people who are closest to our hearts. We pray today for Priscilla and family. 
for Helen, Evelyn, and George, for Tom, for Brenda and family, for Anne, for Alison, for Gillian, for Pat, for Scarlett, for Alan, for Angus, for Christina and David, and for everyone else we are thinking of today. May they know that they are your children, fearfully and wonderfully made. May they know that they are hemmed in before and behind and that your hand is upon them. And may we be able to be a source of light and life in their lives as well. Help us to bring your goodness and your grace into their lives and into the lives of all the people that we are closest to today and in the week to come. And so be with us, help us and strengthen us. May your spirit guide us and support us through all that we do. May we be encouraged and strengthened by the good news that you've given us, that we are loved by you and that your love knows no bounds. So we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll close now with our final hymn, which is You're the Word of God the Father. Now, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and always. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Please be seated. It's been wonderful to worship with you. Um, I just Before we close, I just remind her um, that as our events reopen, um, that we are asking if people could please... Um, uh, take tests before coming along to our events at the coffee morning or the lunch club just as a way to ensure that we're staying safe uh, but for everyone it's been lovely to worship with you all and just a reminder for people that we are going to be um, having a worship meeting afterwards but for now shall we say goodbye to everyone on zoom and folks on zoom if you would wave goodbye to us in the building uh, and may god bless you and keep you in the weeks to come <laughs>